Right, hello everyone. Welcome back to my channel. We're going to have a nice rambling, rambling, ramble about a very interesting subject matter today. We're going to talk about the difference between the right wing and the left wing. Okay. This is a very, very interesting and fundamental subject matter. And this video is something which I've been meaning to make for a very, very, very long time. However, whenever I've sat down to make this video, I've, I've always hit a certain mental brick wall because it is very diff difficult to characterize what ideologies are on the right and what ideologies are on the left. I have written here, I have a notepad in front of me of about, I don't know, 20 different <laughs> concepts and I've divided them down between these you know, left and right. And I'm going to go through them during the course of this video. We're going to talk about them. But I don't know if this is a definitive list. This, this is a speculation of mine. This is a, a work in progress. This is, I'm, essentially, I'm opening up this subject matter for discussion with myself, basically. Because this is how, this is how I think about stuff. You know, I make videos, I throw the ideas out there into the world, and then you get a reaction, or then... The way the what the way the mind works, or at least the way my mind works, is like once you've said it, afterwards you think about it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like what well, like you have the idea in your head and you think, yeah, that makes sense, and then you say it out loud, and as in the process of saying it out loud, you, you always end up getting a new perspective and or, or a deeper understanding of the subject matter. So this is what I want to do today. Now Obviously, this subject matter, what is right, what is left, is fundamental to modern day politics because everything gets put into these two boxes. There is a massive duality, a massive polarization, a massive dichotomy between these two uh, political spheres. But it was not always this way. This is a relatively new introduction into Western thought. Um, for example, you can look, I'm always quoting this guy, but I'll keep doing it. You can look at Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, which was written in roughly 1791 and was written as a reaction to the revolution in France. He was a liberal. He was an Irish Protestant liberal, um, sorry, Whig, sorry. And he was upset about the revolution in France. He didn't like it, too much violence. So he wrote this, this book, very interesting book, which is considered to be the foundation stone for modern day conservatism. Peter Hitchens himself describes himself as a Burkean conservative. And in this book, you will not see any mention of the right or the left. It's totally absent. Uh, in a similar way, Adam Smith's um, Wealth of Nation, very, very boring book, very long, boring book, which I unfortunately forced myself to read. Um, people would say Adam Smith, the father of modern day capitalism. There's no mention of the right wing or the left wing. OK, Mary Wollstonecraft, the mother of modern day feminism, wrote Vindications, Vindication of the Rights of Women. No mention of right wing or left wing. So at, in the in the age of the Enlightenment, essentially, which obviously was the entirety of the 18th century leading up towards the American Revolution and the French Revolution, the twin revolution, the twin Enlightenment wars, as I like to call them. In this age of blossoming of democracy, right, the struggle for freedom of speech, the struggle for universal male suffrage, there was no mention of, of the right or the left. Now, there was a recognition that you did have two separate kind of parties. Obviously, in British politics, you had the Whigs on the one hand and the Tories on the other side. So there was a division, but it was not divided into right and left specifically. Adam Smith, as far as I remember, interesting enough, Adam Smith, as far as I remember, at the end of his Wealth of Nations, he does talk about there being a more liberal element in society and a more conservative element in, in society. I think he even mentions, quite, quite amusingly, he does mention the idea that um, the government should 
promote liberal propaganda in order to stop people from getting too conservative, which is quite funny. Not very capitalist, Adam Smith. Not very laissez-faire, Adam Smith. But anyway, there's always been a recognition that there have been these two sides, but they weren't they weren't designated as right and left. This is a designation which has appeared, as far as I understand it, during the course of the Vic of the Victorian age or, or the 19th century, or perhaps even in the early 20th century. It's really not clearly defined. If you look at the uh, Wikipedia page on this subject matter, it mentions <clears throat> that the concept of right wing and left wing goes all the way back to the French Revolution. Obviously, they had a big meeting. The king himself summoned a, a big meeting uh, to try and settle things because there was a lot of agitation. And some one group of people sat on the left and one group of people sat on the right. And the right wing, the people sitting on the right were the more conservative people. The people sitting on the left were the more radical people. And, and uh, Wikipedia and other sources try and make the case that this is where this all originates from. And the idea being that um, it, it was just a matter of seating. And then somehow with the rise of the Labour movement, the rise of the Labour Party, people started referring to the, the Labour Party as being left wing. And, and then the, the thing solidified in the 20th century. I don't really believe this at all. In my opinion, I can't I can't prove it. But, but then again, we... I haven't found the evidence to prove it, but in my opinion, this this division between right and left comes from Kabbalah, the Jewish esoteric system of thought. And I say this because in this system of thought, of course, they have the tree of life. And in that tree of life, they have two towers, right? Twin towers, very interesting. Of course, on the Temple of Solomon, there were two towers outside the Solomon, outside the temple that you go through in order to enter. But in the in the Kabbalistic tree of life, in which there are ten sephirot, or ten nodes, or ten regions, or ten chakras, or energy centers, or whatever whatever you call it, in the Kabbalistic tree of life, there are ten of these things, three on one side, three on the other. So you have the twin towers within the Kabbalistic uh, tree of life. The tower, the two towers are called Boaz and Jachin. Probably totally mess that up. Boas, of course, reminds me straight away of Franz Boas. Remember that guy? The guy that pushed cultural anthropology on the world. The most important intellectual debate of the 20th century was a debate between Madison Grant and Franz Boas. Madison Grant believed in scientific racism, or just race realism, essentially, in that you have you know, different, this was the original anthropology. You have different races with different characteristics and they produce different civilizations and they are bi biologically different. Franz Boas, the, the Hebrew, came along and said, no, uh, that's not true. Um, everything's a blank slate. Everything is a tabula rasa. Race is not real. And, um, <clears throat> you know, everything's just culture. And, it's, and, and anybody that disagrees with this is an evil racist. And it's this debate, which because once you've crushed scientific racism, the racist has nothing to fall back upon. Now he's, now he's just an ignorant person, you see, who just doesn't like Africans for no reason at all, basically. And so what happens is you have mass immigration into Western nations, and people complain about it, and then they get called, they get called racist. And then they say, but race is real. And then they say, no, it's not. <laughs> race is just culture. There's no such thing as race. Uh, we all bleed red or whatever nonsense. Anyway, I'm just saying, that's an easy way to remember Boas, Franz Boas. So the two um, pillars on the Temple of Jerusalem are, know, are known as Boas and Jachin. They are in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. One, of, of course, is on the left. The other one is on the right. I have seen on the internet. I can't find it right now as I'm searching around. I mean, by the way, you can't find anything on Google these days. I mean, you know, you guys know this anyway, but Yandex is the place to go. You can still find a lot of interesting blogs and a lot of interesting stuff on the net, even today. But you've got to go on Yandex. Maybe DuckDuckGo, I don't know. But Yandex is where I like to go. Um, 
I'm searching around. I have heard before people say that the column on the left is red and the column on the right is blue. But whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, you have the left wing and you have the right wing. These are two uh, Kabbalistic concepts and, and the Kabbalistic system is much like Kundalini Yoga. If you don't know what if you don't know what that is, that is an ancient Indian system of enlightenment through internal energy manipulation. The idea being that you have seven chakras within the body. Can't remember their names off the top of my head. Uh, Mulida is the bottom one. So you have the bottom chakra, and then you have the chakra on the genital, then you have the stomach chakra, then you have the heart chakra, then you have the throat chakra, then you have the third eye, and then you have the crown chakra. And the idea being that you release the energy from the bottom chakra, it goes up, 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 do, 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 all through all of them, and then comes out the top of your head, and you, you obtain enlightenment, essentially. And within this system, there is a right and a left because you, the energy is at the bottom and it kind of you have, um, again, I forget off the top of my head, but you essentially have three energy channels. One is the right, the masculine force. The other one is the left, the feminine force. And then you have a middle channel. And these kind of crisscross through the chakras until they combine at the top. And you know once you clear all the energy blockages then you can obtain you know, your third eye will open and you'll be able to you'll get all kinds of mystical powers and you'll be able to see ghosts and do this that and the other right that is the kundalini system of yoga kundalini tantra very very ancient indian system in my opinion the Kabbal the jewish kabbalistic system is basically this but a less advanced system of this because i i got to be honest with you, honestly i in my opinion, the the Jews probably came from India, or or at least they came from an area that was near India. And Vedic culture was very very prevalent all over that part of the world in ancient times before the rise of Christianity and obviously Islam, which just crushed everything. I mean, you look at Indonesia. I mean, maybe maybe perhaps a lot of people don't even realize this, but Indonesia. And Malaysia, that entire area used to be Hindu, essentially. Uh, they have all kinds of ancient Indian temples. Bali used to be a Hindu island. I know I'm going in the other direction here, but I'm just trying to make the point that Vedic culture was very prevalent over that entire area. And the Jews were moving westward out of that area. And... Um, I'm of the opinion that, I don't know if they got kicked out of India or whatever, but they seem, their their culture seems to be the culture of, you know, tantric Brahmins, essentially. They even have a festival in which they worship Shiva, which <laughs> should tell you everything you need to know. And I, I'm also of the opinion that Jesus returned to India. That's where he learned about Vaishnavism. And essentially, Christianity is Vaishnavism. What is Vaishnavism? It's the worship of Vishnu. And the goal of Vaishnavism is love of God. The goal of Christianity is love of God. It's the same thing. And it would make sense that Jesus would go there because, you know, if he knew, if he was living at that time, he knew his ancestors came from that area. And so he went back to have a look, discovered Vaishnavism, and then came back to Jerusalem. was like, oh my God, you guys are all crazy started throwing the moneylenders out of the temple and got executed for it. You know, that's that's what I believe. Difficult to prove these things because uh, essentially you're just entering into the realm of mythology. But nonetheless, it appears to me that the Kabbalistic system is um, an adaption or, or, or a... It is based upon Kundalini Yoga, but it's got these twin towers in it, and you've got a right wing and you've got a left wing. And the right wing is male, and the left wing is female. And these two forces are kind of struggling against each other, and this is what we see in modern day politics, a right wing struggling against a left wing, and an endless civil war. 
and an endless war essentially of concepts. It's a conceptual war. And what I mean by this is it's it's the Hegelian dialect. That's that's the age that we live in. So who is Hegel? He was a German philosopher. And he proposed that you have um, he proposed that you have the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. And he proposed that this is how mo um, knowledge is obtained. See, I know about all this because of conspiracy theory, by the way. This, this was all over the internet 10, 15 years ago. This is what everybody was talking about, because Alex Jones talked about it a lot. David Icke talked about it a lot. Everybody was talking about it in reaction to... Um, 9-11 it was almost because 9-11 was a cabalistic event okay the twin towers they came down and they got replaced with a single tower incredibly symbolic because in the cabalistic system you got one tower on the other well, one you got one two towers on two sides but the middle path is the path to godhead you see what i'm saying so they bring down these two towers the, you have the neocon expansion, all these wars in the Middle East for Israel, and a new tower. What's it called? The Freedom Tower, or whatever, is built in its place. It's it's incredibly symbolic. So people were talking about this all over the internet. You just don't see it so much anymore. I mean, I guess you do in conspiracy circles. I don't know. But thesis. Antithesis and synthesis. So, so uh, Alex Jones used to explain it in terms of action, reaction, and and well, you, you create a problem, and then there's a reaction to the problem, and then there's the solution to the problem, right? So, <clears throat> you you blow up the twin towers, people get upset, and then you enforce a police state and invade Iraq, basically. This is a cabalistic concept. This and this is a concept from. This is a concept from Hegel. This is German idealism, I suppose. Well, I don't know if that's a bit broad. But, I mean, Hegel was, was recognized as a German idealist. But nonetheless, this is part of the dialectic, okay? And what Hegel was presenting was the idea... I mean, it's, it's such an interest when you get into it. It's so interesting because he's. it seems like he's fundamentally sceptical and he doesn't really believe in any kind of absolute truth. He just seems to believe that we're just kind of muddling along and things happen and then and then we kind of go into the future, right? Um, he has no absolute sense of what is right or what is wrong. It's just stuff happens and then people react to it and then culture moves forward, if you see what I mean. But anyway, he proposed a dialectic that you have, um, you know, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. So you have an endless war between the left wing and the right wing. You have an endless war between the Tory party and the Labour party. And civilization moves forwards, perhaps towards a utopia. Karl Marx obviously adapted this into... Um, dialectical materialism i think he called it so he took out like the spiritual component and just said like it's an endless war or it's an endless economic war leading towards a utopia it's very cabalistic there is a book on the internet i've never read it i've been meaning to read it for years but there you go that's the story of my life which talks about the esoteric elements within hegel's work was he a freemason i've no idea was he involved in these kind of thoughts I've got no idea but whatever the case we we now live in the world of the left wing versus the right wing and we live in the Hegelian dialect whether anybody even knows what that means or not that is the world in which we live we live in a world of constant civil war and we live in the world of clash lazy thought in my opinion we live in a world of clashing concepts conceptual thought and what i mean by that is <laughs> there's a random philosophy youtube video which i watched quite a few years ago which kind of blew my mind but this old gray head lecturer was just explaining hegel and he was talking about concepts and he was just saying that, you know, you look at you look at the old old days, 
philosophers used to make arguments to try to prove sp specific things. But Hegel is talking about conceptual thought. So instead of making an argument, you know, um, X, Y, Z, therefore this. Instead, now you've got a concept, which essentially is a collection of ideas jumbled together. And this concept is, excuse me, is being judged or thought about in comparison to another concept, right? The classic one being capitalism versus socialism. These are concepts. These are ideologies is another word for it, I suppose. But these are these just see what I mean? Capitalism isn't like a single idea. A single specific I policy idea would be I don't know, private ownership, right? Or or nationalization of utilities. That is a quite clear cut um policy. I am in favor of the nationaliz of nationalization of utilities. But is that a capitalist idea or is that a socialist idea? Well, some socialists may claim it's, so it's socialist. Some capitalists may claim it's capitalist. It gets, it's getting pulled between these two ideologies. Do you see what I mean? The modern day left wing, like the modern day Labour Party. Is it socialist? Well, it's rejected democratic socialism. They got rid of clause four when Tony Blair came in, so they don't want to nationalise stuff anymore. The focus is now on social justice and the welfare state. Right? The focus is now on the sexual revolution. Liberty. It's it's the focus is now on the on the Frankfurt School. The sexual utopia. So is it still socialist though? Well yeah. But what I'm trying to say here is that the concept of socialism transforms over time and the concept of capitalism transforms over time. And when you have people on the Internet endlessly arguing about I'm a capitalist or I'm a socialist, it's weak thinking. It's lazy thought. All you are doing is waving a flag and saying I'm on this camp or I'm on that camp, basically. And we all do it. I do it. And I will continue to do it because I don't really have any choice because that is the world in which we live and that is the way in which people think. People think in conceptual terms. People think in right-wing versus left-wing terms. People think in flag-waving terms. People think in, in, in this duality, this dichotomy that we live in. That's, that's how people think. The entire political vocabulary is just centered around this. It's moronic. Actually, it's very childish. It's oh, I'm a capitalist and, and you're a dumb socialist. Oh, I'm 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 on the left wing and people on the left wing are good and people on the right wing are evil. This is like fucking ten year old thinking, childish thinking. But that's that's where we're at. That's where we are at. So. Yeah. Put a gun to my head and I'll tell you I'm right wing and I'm a capitalist and I am an individualist, right? Because, well, I, I am broadly in line with those people, with the gammon, the Brexit voting gammon. Uh, but it's, it's so much more complicated than that because I would nationalize the utilities and that's broadly speaking a socialist idea. And historically speaking, I'm actually, although I am in favor of a king, I believe in a constitutional monarchy, I'm not really in favor of an absolute monarchy. So I sympathize deeply with the peasants' revolt. And the roundheads, you know, in the English Civil War. I'm not sure I would be on Cromwell's team anymore. I used to say that I would be, because they were they were the right wingers of that age. But now now I'm looking back, I'm thinking, actually, do you know what? Charles the First was a bit of a flipping moron, you know, wanting to wanting to shut down Parliament and impose um, his autocracy on us. Like, no, thank you very much. I will have my Saxon liberty. So, really speaking, I'm I'm, I'm a little bit of a roundhead. So, am I left wing or right wing? Well, you know, it's. So, but this is the world in which we live. Rubbish, shallow thinking isms, right? 
um, squabbling against each other, flag bearing ism squabbling against each other. And it's it's Kabbalistic and it's the Hegelian dialect and nobody really knows. No, there's no real clear definition that I've seen. I mean, you can point me in the direction, but nobody, re nobody really even knows why we use these terms. This is what's really fascinating. Like there, it wasn't like some great influential political philosopher came along and wrote a book saying, we have to divide the political world into the right wing and the left wing and everything has to be characterized in these terms. Right, left, center right, <laughs> center left, far right, far left. Who, who wrote this rule book? Who, like, why are we following along with this intellectual framework? Why am I far right? You know? There, there was no moment in time in which somebody said, yes, from now on, we are going to talk about everything within, within this paradigm of thought. It just happened. It's crept up, um, which, again, makes me very suspicious that it's Kabbalistic thought and it's coming ultimately from secret societies, be it the small hats in general or the Masons or whatever. Uh, but I think it's useful for the oligarchs that rule over us to keep us divided and fighting amongst ourselves. That's obvious, right? Stop us from uniting against the real enemy, which is the oligarchs. And I know that's a very hippie-ish thing to say, but it is true. So, 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 I want to proceed forwards. Let's talk about my, let's talk about what I think is on the right and what I think is on the left. And we'll try and get into this and people can react to this. I would, I would really like to hear people's ideas in the in the comment section below, because I'm, my mind is still not settled on this subject matter. And maybe it just can't be. Maybe it's impossible to be subject settled on this subject matter because it's all like I say, it's all wishy washy conceptual thought. It's all just flag waving nonsense. At the end of the day, it's it's murky. It's not clear. And so maybe it really is just impossible to get clear in your mind on what is right on the right wing and what is on the left wing. But, no, but nonetheless, I'm going to try. So I've got my list here. Right, so let's get into this. So I've got my list. Right, left. Well, first of all, right wing is male. And the left wing is female. Okay. Um pretty straightforward. I think pretty much everyone agrees on that. Um, <clears throat> the right wing, I would argue, believes in God. The left wing believes in chaos. Or alternatively, the left wing is pagan. Or alternatively, the left wing worships the devil or Satan. In occult terms, they have, they talk about the, the left hand path. No, that's a famous um, phrase used by people like Alistair Crawley or what have you to describe the magical path that they're following. So <clears throat> I would see the division as between between God and chaos. And what I mean by that is that essentially those are the two options that you can believe in. If you ask yourself, where does the universe come from? You have what well, you have three options, actually. But one of them is insane, so it has to be rejected. Okay, option number one, the right-hand path, is to say that God, sorry, God created the universe. So everything comes from God. He is the original cause, and he created the universe, and everything comes from him. Okay, very straightforward and simplistic explanation. Then you have the insane explanation, which is the idea that everything came from nothing, i.e. there was a big bang and everything just popped into existence. This is insane because 100% of all empirical evidence tells us that everything in this universe comes from something else. There is a causal chain of events that has led to that whatever it is. Nothing just happens for no reason. Whether, whether it is a physical activity or a mental activity or whatever it is. Everything is caused by something else. And yet people want to say that the sum total of everything is caused by nothing it just pops into existence for no reason at all it's insane it doesn't make any sense 
Um, I guess some people take that position. But there you go. Um, I guess there's a lot of scientists out there who just aren't as smart as they like to think they are. Um, I have heard I've heard people say, oh, just give us one miracle and we'll explain the rest. Right. That's the scientific position. Then, of course, you have the other position, which is to believe that there's an infinite regress of causes. So the universe has always been here and it always will be here. And it's just like a flowing river, essentially. OK, so this can actually work with the Big Bang. I've never seen anybody explain it in these terms. But if you think about it, the idea of the Big Bang is that the universe is at one point it's the size of a marble and then it's the size of an atom. And then before that, it's the size of a proton. And then before that, it's the size of a quark. And then before that, it's the size of something even smaller. So this process could go back and back and back into infinity. You could make the argument that, that, that at one point the universe was just infinitely small. And obviously, like, if time and space are related to each other, then you're talking about just an absolutely enormous amount of energy. And so the rules of time and space would all get all muddled up and whatever. But you could make the argument that essentially the universe has always been here. And it's just been growing for an infinite amount of time. <clears throat> or you could make the Big Bang Big Crunch idea, right? But whatever the case, there's no reason to say that the universe just popped into existence from nowhere. You could just say it's always been here. And if you're saying that, you are essentially saying that the universe came from chaos, right? As in lots of energy just moving around and struggling and, and then poof, here we are, right? We evolved, okay? By a random combination of elements crashing into each other. So this is the old pagan argument. This is what the Greeks said. Everything came from chaos. This is what the Norse pagans said. Everything came from the weird or from chaos or whatever they called it. But the idea being that th there was no overarching God which created everything. It's just there was this random energy crashing into each other and then the Titans appeared and then Zeus appeared and then he killed his father and etc etc. Order from chaos, essentially, right? That's the pagan idea. So, which is interesting because this is why pagans are totally immoral. And I know they get upset about this. I sympathize with pagans. I do believe in God, but I'm not a Christian. Um, and I sympathize with people who want to worship trees and animals and the rain god and what have you. I, th I think paganism is healthy. I think that um, everybody has, the way I see it, because I believe in reincarnation, we're all stuck in the endless cycle of birth and death. Different people have different qualifications. Some people are qualified to worship a supreme God. Some people aren't. They just do not have that inclination. They're not very idealistic. And for people like that, it's better if they just worship trees or what have you. Because if they don't, they won't worship anything and they'll just sink down into pure materialism. So, and that's what's happened, essentially, because Christianity's collapsed and instead of people rising up, it's, we've just crashed down into mindless atheism and sludge. Um, so if that is essentially Christianity and Islam, these Abrahamic religions, they forced everyone to worship God. You see, they forced everybody you will worship the supreme being and there, there is no room to worship anything else and if you try to worship anything else we will kill you we will burn you at the stake in the name of god in the name of love <laughs> right and so then what happens is people's natural inclination to worship the planets or nature or whatever because there's no room for people to express that it gets squashed down, it gets repressed, and then it gets twisted. And then it turns into something nasty, like Satanism, you see. Because Satanism, in my opinion, is just the worship of Saturn. In the old Roman Empire, Saturn was, of course, the king of the gods. Gave birth to Jupiter. Okay. Um, and 
So Christianity came along, it replaces the old Roman religion, so Saturn becomes Satan, it becomes something evil, because they wanted to crush that. So it's natural to worship the planet Saturn, it's natural wor to worship the planet Jupiter, it's national natural to worship the ocean but it neptune and what have you but if you squash this down that now it will be done in secret and now it will be perverted and it will be twisted into something dark satanism right um something angry and rebellious and then and there'll be a lot of resentment and oh we want to tear down christianity because christianity has repressed us and it's kind of true Christianity did repress the worship of Saturn, the planet Saturn. Do you see what I'm saying here, guys? I'm not saying I'm a Satanist, obviously not. But if you repress people's religious inclinations, you're going to create a lot of problems. And they, they do not have this problem in India. In India, there's two quite clear distinctions. You have the Vaishnavas, they worship God. You have the Shaivites, they worship Shiva, and they worship ghosts, and they worship God knows what. And people, according to their different inclinations, they will worship whatever aspect of the Supreme Being they want. And they all get along. There's no clash. Now, of course, a Christian would look at that and say, well, you know, they're all pagans. What are you talking about? They're all Hindus. Well, that's because you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, anyway, <clears throat> point being, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, I was just saying, yeah. Pagans have no morality. I mean, they do, but at the end of the day, they believe in might is right. Okay, that's, you know, will to power. Might is right. That is the pagan belief. Because there is no supreme being judging everything. And if there's no supreme being giving a final judgment saying this is right, this is wrong, and ordering things, then all you're going to have is the strongest person is right. You see... The strong, the, you know, strength is is truth, and that's why the oligarchs of this world want to promote atheism because they want to rule over us. They don't. The oligarchs of this world do not want people to believe in God because God will be above them. They do not want people to, you know, Mark Zuckerberg wants to be the supreme authority essentially. Uh, Jeff Be Bezos wants to be the supreme authority. He doesn't want people looking at anything transcendent to him. That's why they promote materialism. Uh, that's one explanation of why there's no morality in paganism. But the other deeper explanation is to understand the problem of infinite regress. This is why you have to reject chaos as a source of creation for the world. I mean, firstly, because chaos never actually creates anything anyway, does it? It's just it's good at destroying. It's not really good at creating. Look at look around. Everything of, of beauty is created by the comes from the mind of the man first, and then it's made. But anyway, when you, what is the problem of infinite regress? The problem of infinite regress is there's a fire. You want to put out the fire, so you've got a whole line of people with buckets, and they're lining up so they can get water from the well to put out the fire but if there's no well you're never going to have any water and you're, and you're never going to put the fire out okay or there's a bus in order to get on the bus you need a pound coin to get on the bus and there's an infinite queue of people trying to get on the bus no one's got a pound coin the guy at the front asks the guy behind him he asks the guy behind him and duh, 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 duh. nobody's got a pound coin nobody's ever going to get on the bus or there's a train there's an infinite set of carriages but there's no engine to drive it forwards. Okay, there's three analogies for you. That's the problem of infinite regress. You need something to push the thing forwards, to start off with. And um, you could say, oh, well, that's just silly because everything's been moving forever anyway. Okay, well, it becomes a lot clearer when you start to think about morality. The problem of infinite regress in morality. So what do I mean by this? So... Um, John tells Barry to kill Mark, right? And Barry says to John, well, why? And John says, well, David told me to tell you to do it. And so then Barry asks David, and David says, well, Fred told me. And then, you know, Fred says it was Henry, and then Henry says it was 
John and or whatever, you know, an infinite list of people. And so <clears throat> I forget the names of music. But anyway, the guy that's being told to kill somebody, he's going back and back and back and back and back in an infinite chain of people trying to find out why this person is, is telling him to do this thing. Why this person is telling him that morally he has to do this. And nobody can give him the answer. Because nobody has any authority. Right? Now do you see? Now do you see how clear it is? Somebody has to have authority in order to tell somebody what is right or what is wrong. If there's nobody there at the beginning saying, no, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, and I say this is good and that is bad, and I say do this. If there's nobody at the, at the top of the hierarchy saying, you know, this is what's what, then essentially you have an absence of morality. I hope that makes it really clear. I've been trying to explain the problem of infinite regress to a lot of people for a long time. A lot of people just don't get it. But that, I think, is the best explanation. There must be someone at the top of the hierarchy. Otherwise, nothing is right and nothing is wrong. All you have is John telling Fred to kill Harry. Because he wants him to. Because of his individual selfish desire. Which is why I'm saying pagans believe, ultimately, they believe in might is right. Because they believe in chaos, because they believe in just energies clashing into each other. Okay, so we're going on a bit of a tangent here, but essentially that's the difference between the right wing and the left wing. People on the right, the men, they believe in God, they believe in hierarchy, they believe the universe was created. People on the left wing, the females, they believe in darkness, they believe in light, <laughs> they believe the universe evolved, they don't believe in an ultimate right or wrong, they're, they're, they're fundamentally sceptical, actually. They believe in lies. People on the right wing believe in the truth. People on the left wing believe in lies. This is why people on the left lie all the time. Like, bare-faced lies. And you're scratching your head and you're like, I don't understand, like, like what, the hell you, what the hell do you mean a man is a woman? Um, that doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? Are you insane? And, th and the thing is, they, they're just not thinking about it in the same way. You're, when you're talking to a liar then you're just talking to someone who just says things because he's saying the right thing in the right situation because he thinks that's the right thing to say in that situation so he can get whatever he needs to get. And he's not interested in the truth. He's not interested in what is actually right or what is actually wrong. He's just playing a power game. He or she, or whoever it is. And that's what the left wing is doing. They, they just lie. I mean, and for them, it's nothing. And, and, of course, the, when you lie, you believe your own lies. <clears throat> this is why I keep saying again and again and again, like, it's all, it's all about the truth. It's all, this is why you've got to be absolutely physically autistic in your quest for the truth, okay? Because, because if you're not, then you will be, you'll lie to yourself and you'll be cheated, essentially. You know, classic example, my personal journey. I obviously got involved with the alt-right in 2016. And then I discovered there were a bunch of you-know-whos in the alt-right. And certain people, certain famous personalities of certain live streams were entertaining these you-know-whos. And I pointed out, I said, well, hang on a minute. Like, that's total bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. Like, I don't care how famous you are. That's... What are you doing? And so I got um, disavowed and ostracized from the alt-right because I spoke the truth about something, you know, like that. And then because I was ostracized I, and I was able to take a step back from that movement and look at that movement and think about its fundamental assertions from a objective viewpoint and I was able to scratch my head and I was able to say well hang on a minute like maybe moustache man isn't actually our hero all right because this you know who guy that you've got on your live stream he's telling everybody that moustache man is fantastic maybe he doesn't have our best interest at heart and why is he shitting on the English all the time 
And why is everybody in this movement shitting on the English all the time? So I started to ask all these questions, and that's how I managed to see through all the neo-Nazi nonsense. Most people can't do it because they're fundamentally dishonest. Well, they're not fun. I mean, if, you've, if you're in the dissident right or in the alt-right, you're more honest than most. So well done. Congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. You are so close to the truth. <laughs> But that's, I mean, that's another problem that people face, I think, that um, when you get involved in conspiracy theories, there's ego comes in, pride comes in, and it stops people from going to the next level because they, you know, they get involved in conspiracy theory, they discover some deep, dark, mysterious truth, and then it goes, and they're like, oh my God, and it's kind of shocking, and then it goes to their head, and they think, I know everything now. Because they try and tell other people, ordinary people, and those ordinary people tell them they're stupid, to shut up. And now they're def on the defensive. They don't want anybody else to tell them that they're wrong because they know that they're right about this one thing, whether it's 9-11 being an inside job or don't take the vax or flat earth or race realism or whatever it is, whatever aspect of the conspiracy it is. They know they're right about that. And so they're like... Arr! I will not tolerate anybody telling me I'm wrong. I know the truth. And it's like, okay, you've got one piece of the puzzle. Yeah? But it's bigger than that and it's deeper than that. And there's there's a there's a path. You've got to follow a path. And you've got to be humble to follow that path. So you're gonna you've got to admit that you're wrong sometimes. Most people don't want to do that, especially e celebs, because they get a position within the hierarchy and they get followers and they don't want to lose their followers they don't they've got all these people patting them on the back saying oh well done you're right they don't want to lose that so they become like what's, what's the word ossified you know they just they've got their spot now and they will stick with it for their own selfish egotistical reasons it's just human nature really that's all it is um it's like it's rare to see people change I think once they've got their spot they'll generally because also there's also an ego thing like you'll you'll be on the internet and they'll argue with other people and you know they'll argue their side and no one wants to admit that they were wrong right so they'll just double down because obviously like you know these things always degrade into insults and stuff so yeah um, but ultimately, it's the path of truth. Keep saying this again and again and again. People make the mistake of thinking that you can know the truth through the intellect, as if the truth is some kind of mathematical equation. It is not. Now, you do need intelligence to, to discover the truth. But... It's a combination of intelligence and virtue. And essentially, it's the virtue of honesty. You need the virtue of honesty. In the similar way, when you're a child, you do something wrong, and your mom or your dad tells you you have to admit that you did something wrong. And it hurts. It's hard, right? It's like you don't want to admit that you, I don't know, put a brick through a window accidentally or you kick the football through the <laughs> kitchen window or whatever or, you know did something really bad that you shouldn't have done and you know it's like oh no, no, no. And, but you know you've done something wrong and you've got to admit it and it kind of hurts but you, you do admit it and you apologize and then you feel better afterwards you know so most children learn maybe children don't learn this these days i don't know because there's some terrible parents out there really are um but it's a struggle, isn't it, to tell the truth, to admit that you're wrong, essentially, to be honest. Um, you have to have a degree of humility. You've got to suffer, I think. You've got to suffer. You've got to get knocked down, and then you're like, oh, God, like, please, like, what is going on in this world? Please, somebody tell me. You know what I mean? Um, you've got to get your ego crushed, I think. So you've got to, you've got to be honest. Um, and, and through the virtue of honesty, classic example, like I just pointed out with the, the you-know-whos and the movement. With 
with the virtue of honesty, the truth will be revealed to you. If you are not honest, if you do not cultivate that virtue, if you are in the habit of lying, you'll just lie to yourself and you'll believe your own lies, I think. You'll just end up thinking, yeah, Matt, you'll, you will think that two plus two equals five. Like that famous Star Trek scene where Picard gets kidnapped by the Romulans and they're torturing him and there's four dots and he's telling Picard to tell him that there's five dots and you know in the end he gets rescued but he's he turns around to Riker and he says you know what I saw five dots <laughs> in the end he actually saw it and this is what happens people believe they lie so much they believe their own lies because they can't handle like the fact that they're totally full of shit because everyone everyone thinks everyone wants to think that they're right you know so but I think ultimately everybody wants to speak the truth because you look at children. Children are very honest. It's natural for us to be honest. And honesty is deeply connected and related to innocence. Um, and innocence is happiness, essentially. And the more you lie, the more crooked you, you become. You just turn into a little gremlin, essentially. <laughs> right? You just turn into a little gremlin. Um, and you see, like, I mean, why, why is it people can tell when other people are lying? It's because naturally the person wants to tell the truth. So when it, when a person is lying to you, they will indicate, you know, they'll scratch their head or they'll do something, you know, do something to tell you that they're lying because people don't like lying. The, the spirit, the soul wants to tell the truth. Why does the soul want to tell the truth? The soul wants to tell the truth because the soul wants to reconnect with God. And if you want to reconnect with God, you have to tell the truth. That's the path of knowledge. And then you can progress along the path of knowledge. You see, you start lying. Uh, you know, everything just falls to pieces. Your, your mind gets covered. Like, like uh, E. Michael Jones says, you know, lust covers the mind. Yeah, well, lying covers the mind as well. So anyway, a little bit of a ramble there. But anyway, the right wing, the right wing is male, believes in God, it's the day, it's heaven, it's order. The left wing is chaos, it's women, it's the night, it's hell. I mean, this is making women look very bad here, but I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want people to think I hate women. I'm just saying, like, this is from the occult perspective, from a magical perspective, Women are irrational. Men are rational. Women are emotional. Women are fluid. Women, women actually, they don't, they're not really moral creatures like men are. Um, a, a woman's morality, at the end of the day, a woman's morality is to follow her husband. And that's Vedic. That's written in the, in the Veda. And if you go to India, you ask any chaste wife, she will show you five fingers, right? Every every Hindu girl in India learns this. I don't remember the names because I'm not a Hindu girl. But there are five famous wives, chaste wives, and you're supposed to know their names. And these are the, you know, this is what you're supposed to be following, right? Two of these wives were married to demons. One is the wife of Ravana, the demon that kidnapped Sita. The other is the wife of Hirani Kashipu, the demon that was so powerful and so evil that he conquered heaven and changed the laws of karma so that if you did good things, you'd go to hell. And if you did bad things, you'd go to heaven, right? Imagine that guy. Imagine that fucking guy. You know what I mean? Whew. Uh, but his wife was considered to be a chaste and good wife. Imagine being married to that. Why was she a chaste wife? Why was she good? Because she was loyal to her, her husband. And that is the dharma of a woman. Women are not... In, they, they don't know the difference between right and wrong. They don't know it. Not really. They feel shame. I don't know if they feel guilt. <laughs> I don't know. I guess they do. But... I mean, they are human, so they do, but they're such narcissistic creatures. 
It sounds like I hate women here. I, I, I want to emphasize I don't hate women, but, you know, if women were men, you'd hate them. <laughs> you know, take the mind of a woman, and put it in the body of a man, and you just you just think, oh, my God, what the hell is wrong with you? Um, that's just the way they are. That's just the way they're constructed. Um, they are necessary for reproducing. And, and you know, this... this aspect of their nature it has a good side and it has a bad side because generally speaking i mean it's not so true these days because feminism has destroyed this but in a more traditional society a mother will love her son unconditionally and she will cherish him and she will cherish her family and she will stand by her family regardless of what bad thing her family members have done and this is very good um so instead of looking at them as being these adamic creatures, these you know rule breakers, it's best to just understand their function within society. Their function is to create children and then to raise these children and to be very, very loyal and connected to their children and to, to build and maintain a family and hold that family together, regardless of who is doing right or, or who is doing wrong. You see, that's what they're very, very good at. Um, they don't really care. They're not designed to care about you know, where the money's coming from. They want a man who makes money. They don't really care that much about how he makes the money. You know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Because it's not really their job to. It's not really their job to care. Um... So it's it's a very interesting and revealing qu question to ask somebody like oh, I don't know I'm going on a slight tangent but a, but a, closely related I mean the the question of if you had a brother and he um, killed someone would you tell the police and if people just say yes it's like well you're loyal to the state you're not loyal to your family right. And in a similar way, and I, I would argue that's bad. I think you should be loyal to your family first. Of course, the real answer is to say, well, well who did he kill and why did he kill him? And what's the sit situation? Like, was he, was it really bad? Did he just kill some innocent person because he's a psycho? Or maybe there was a fight and things got out of control? Like, well, what's the, that's the real answer. Um, but really, you should be loyal to your family first and if you're if you're looking for a wife you should ask her the question like if you had a child i've seen somebody do this on the internet actually if you had a child and somebody like murdered your child or hurt your child like would you want them to die would you want the death penalty to for that person and some women i've seen them like they just say oh well maybe it depends on the context you know let's say somebody rapes your child or oh, maybe oh, i don't know it's like what the fuck like you like what you you're just missing a, a really basic part of your brain there i mean that is the one thing that women should be good at and that is to be ruthlessly loyal uh, to their families and to just want to utterly fucking destroy anybody that messes with them Anybody that messes with their children just fucking annihilate them. Women are very good at that. Regardless of whether their children are in the right or the wrong. A good woman will be loyal to her children. A woman that stands there and she's like, oh, I don't know. Fuck that bitch. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's an interesting like tangent to go down just to think about. But... I mean, to give you another example, I made a video about it. I'm not going to mention names in this video, but whatever. Some e-celeb girl, she was on the internet, right? Right wing, a right wing e-celeb girl. Okay, oh, so based and trad, right? And she's saying, like, men should keep their dick in their pants. And, you know, if your husband fuck somebody else you just divorce him girl and it's like whoa 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 whoa, hey, whoa hang on a minute i thought you're supposed to be based and traditional i'm not saying the husband should cheat on the wife but but you're telling me just because your husband 
cheats on you, you're going to fucking destroy your family. You're going to deprive your children of their father just because your husband fucked some hoe. Like, you, so you will throw your family away so easily. Like garbage. Oh, you've offended me. I am a I am a woman, and you offended me, and I'm now I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to take all your money. I'm going to take your children from you. What's what's trad about that? I can understand you're upset because he cheated on you. Okay, well punch his face in then. You know, break a freaking saucepan over his head. You know, scream and shout and cry and do all the stuff that women do, right? Smash the house up. Smash his car up. Whatever, but don't divorce him. Right? Uh, where's the jealousy? Where's the attachment? Where's the feeling of, I'm not going to let this other whore steal my man? Where is it? You just throw him away just like that? So easily? No loyalty. You see. And it's interesting, actually, because, like, fundamental on a psychological level, women actually are more loyal than men in a way, because women are naturally monogamous. I mean, yes, women sleep around, but it's natural for women to, to practice serial monogamy. And I say that because men are attracted to beauty and youth. Women are attracted to power. And so a man can sleep with lots of beautiful young women because he's like, well, they're all beautiful and they're young, so I'm attracted to all of them, right? Well, you know. Um, but a woman is attracted to power, and so she's so naturally speaking, she's only ever going to be attracted to one man because she wants that man to have power over her. She's giving herself to him. She's viewing him as a powerful man, and, and she's submitting to him. She's like, yes, I am yours. You tell me what to do. She won't admit that, but that's what's going on, right? So she won't be sleeping with lots of um, men at the same time. They'll, she'll practice serial monogamy. She'll be with one guy, and then she'll get fed up with him, and then get another one, then another one, then another one. That's the psychology of a woman. So they are actually naturally more loyal, in a way, um, than men. So when you have all these ancient scriptures encouraging women to be loyal, they're just they're really just encouraging their own natural instinct, the best their best quality. And of course it's for their own protection. But anyway, slight tangent. The right wing believes in God. The right wing is male. The right wing is so I've got the sun in my eyes, I can't even read. The right the right wing is day. It is heaven. It is order. The left wing is chaos, it is women, it is the night, it is hell. Um, order and chaos again. Um, I would argue, moving on, I would argue that the right wing is individualism and the left wing is collectivism. Okay? Now, a lot of people will disagree with me on this. This is where I'll probably get some friction with some right wingers on the internet. A lot of right wingers are obviously fans of national socialism. They think that national socialism is very, very um, right. I mean, there's a whole debate, isn't it? There's a whole like Sargon is involved in this debate. Peter Hitchens is involved in this debate. Hitchens famously wrote an article. I think it was like a year ago. I never reacted to it. I really should have done, but he wrote some famous article pointing out that calling right wings Nazis was a slur because Nazis are left wing and there's a big hoo-ha about it. But he's right. Economically speaking, Nazis are left wing. Economically speaking, Nazis believe in collectivism. Socialism. They're, they're socialists. Like The clue is in the name, right? Um, they're not capitalists. Capitalism is intertwined with with individualism. What is capitalism? It means you own the capital, which means you own property and you accumulate capital, right? Um, collectivism means everything's owned by the collective. It's owned by society. It's nationalized. So, 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 kids, um... I would argue individualism is more masculine because ultimately the goal of life is to obtain the truth, 
is to follow your own path and you need freedom of speech in order to do this and you need religious freedom in order in order to do this ultimately it's it's all down to you and god that's why i believe in, in capitalism liberalism to a certain extent i believe in freedom i do not want to live in a totalitarian society where people are telling me what to think women do women do want to be told what to think essentially by their husbands they do not have the rebellious individual spirit to go off by themselves i mean they do have a rebellious a certain re rebellious spirit which is natural to them um and it's kind of healthy that they do because if they didn't i guess they'd just get totally bullied by the men wouldn't they so they it's natural for them to push back against male control it's natural and it's healthy i think and there is a certain female solidarity that always has been always will be um which again natural and healthy like a lot of natural healthy things it's good until it's until it's not good it's it's good when it's in its own place right um <laughs> but <clears throat> ultimately i think individualism is masculine because what is it what is it to be a man to be a man is to stand on your own two feet and to do your own thing and to be in in control of your environment right think of the cowboy on his ranch on the prairie fighting against the indians but he's got his he's by himself he's got his gun he's got his wife he's got his family he's built his own wood cabin he's raising his own animals he's he's in control he's not dependent on any on anybody else he is a survivalist he's on his own he's doing his thing he doesn't need anybody else it's very 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 masculine the cowboy is the uber masculine force within american culture of course they've rejected him now very interesting i've been saying for years right wingers in america should be rallying behind the cowboy around clint eastwood around john wayne he is the symbol of masculine america i mean even from a legal point of view you should be telling these stories of how these people lived and comparing the freedoms that they had a few hundred years ago well 150 years ago or whatever compared to the you know the lack of liberty today because it's enshrined in law isn't it but instead retards in america want to rally behind moustache man instead but anyway whatever point being very masculine survivalist ted gazinski obviously talked about this how emasculating it is to live in a, a society in which basically everything is done for you you're essentially you're alienated i want to do i'm gonna going i've been thinking about doing this for years but i want to do a um yeah, I want to I want to make a video on alienation, the word itself, because it's a very interesting word because it has its roots in it's a legal term. Originally, to alienate something means to um, pass it on, um, and then of course you have illegal aliens, and then of course you have alienation as a feeling of dissociation and disconnection with society. So it's a psychological word as well. It's many different words. Many different meanings to that word. But anyway, <laughs> Ted Kaczynski did not use alienation, but if effectively he was describing alienation in that you have people in the modern world, men in the modern world who are not in control of their environments. They're not they're not growing their own food, they don't build their own houses, they're not they don't have the right to bear arms, they don't they can't defend themselves, they're not a law unto themselves, or they don't really have control, like legal control over their situation. They're being preyed upon by higher legal forces, which they don't really know or understand. Unlike a cowboy who, like, you shoot the bad guy, maybe you've got to talk to the sheriff about it, but you can figure it out, you know? Um, they, yeah, the modern man is not survivalist. He's not in control of his environment. That's why, in order to regain control, it's very, very healthy to get involved with creative um artistry okay because if you for example i like to make music right you've probably heard some of my music on the, on the channel right this is a creative outlet and i'm in control of that it's my music it's my guitar it's my singing it's my words 
I made it, nobody else. I am in control of it, okay? I'm not really in control of my television or my computer or what's going on in the news or what's going on at work or what's going on in many, many aspects. But I'm in control of the music. See what I'm saying? There's a there's um, well, masculinity there, I suppose. The music itself, again, very individualistic, creative force coming from deep within inside, inside you. Um, I mean, that's another argument I put lower down, but actually, I don't think that's on the list. I should put that on the list. Like it's it's um, I put privacy versus non-privacy, privacy being right wing, non-privacy being left wing. But solitude, I think, is very masculine. Again, connected to the idea of survivalism. Yeah, survivalism, right wing, dependency, left wing. Women are dependent. Men are survivalist. Survivalism is connected to individualism. Collectivism is is connected to dependency. Yeah, I mean, oh man, there's lots of things I haven't put in this list. That's why I'm saying this video is really a um, it's a stab. It's a it's, I'm opening up this subject. I'll probably come back to this in a year's time and I'll listen to this whole video and write down some more concepts to get it clear in my head. But yeah, you I mean you can see that, right? Women are dependent. Uh, women are urban, you could argue. Urban, left-wing, in nature, right-wing, perhaps. Right? You could see that because the closer you are to nature, the more survivalist you are, the more individualist you are, the more masculine you are, the more you're standing on your own two feet, the more you're in control, the more you have freedom um, and freedom of speech. Okay? Again, why why is freedom of speech masculine? Because a man says what he wants, right? He says what he wants. And you have to have freedom of speech, as I was saying earlier. You discover, the, you, you discover God or you discover the truth, regardless of whether you believe in God or not. You, most people want to discover the truth. You need to discover the truth. Why? So you know what's right and what's wrong. That's really the essence of philosophy. It's what should I do? Regardless of whatever metaphysical theory you have, whatever the epistemological theory you have of how the universe functions, the, the real concept is, the real question is, I want to be happy, how can I be happy? What, so, which is, what should I do? So the real philo philosophical question is always a moral one. What is, what is right? What's going to make me happy? You know, And in order to know this, you have to be honest so that you can discover the truth. So it, it requires virtue in order, to, in order to discover the truth. But honesty by itself is, well, it is enough, but you also need freedom of speech. In fact, I guess honesty will give you freedom of speech because you'll say the truth regardless of whether you're allowed to say it or not, won't you? Uh, so... Yeah, you could argue freedom of speech. Freedom of speech comes from the virtue of honesty. Yeah, because you yeah because you believe in the truth, so you'll speak the truth, right? Whatever the case, freedom of speech is necessary so that you can explore all different types of ideas and all different types of solutions to various different problems, and then you can find the truth. If you don't have freedom of speech then you won't be able to find the truth because you'll be constricted in what you can think and what you can say. So the right wing believes in freedom of speech, the left wing believes in censorship. And freedom of speech is, again, individualistic. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's your mind. It's your mind and it's your relationship with God. At the end of the day, you're the one that's going to die. Okay, You're going to lie down on your deathbed you're going to close your eyes and then it's just you alone and your maker. And you're going to have to walk that path alone. Nobody else with you. No collectivism with you. You by yourself. The final journey. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to find out, aren't you? Right? This is why we had a reformation. This is why the European struggle for liberty has been the European struggle against collectivism, essentially against Christian communism, essentially. A lot of people get upset about this. I'm not anti-Christian. I do believe in God. But Christianity has been mixed with 
you know, it it is the ancient world's communism essentially. That's what that's what it is. Constantine the Great enslaved the people of Europe. How? In three ways. Firstly, he took away their freedom of speech because he took away their freedom of religion. Secondly, he took away their history because he replaced their history with a Jewish history book called the Bible. And thirdly, he pushed everybody down into serfdom. He made them serfs. He connected them to the land. 90% of people, perhaps more than 90%. You belong to the manor now. You belong to the lord of the manor. And part of this was collectivism it was communism this is where the this is why this is where the word communism comes from because in the old old england we had the common land like wimbledon common okay like remember the Wim <laughs> remember the one was wimbledon i looked these guys up the other day cartoon for kids there were these wombles they live on wimbledon they're like bears little bears and they pick up rubbish and they recycle stuff okay and they live in a communal lifestyle and um their children don't their children get to pick their own names interestingly enough and they don't really like humans because humans are so wasteful uh but the lady that created this book which then became the, the children's tv series was associated with the fabian society famous communist group in England. Nonetheless, the point I'm making is Wimbledon Common. Wimbledon Common is an old common land area that's famous. It's, it's England's most famous old common land, right? Now it's famous for tennis, but there is Wimbledon Common. You can go there in London. You can walk across it. I've walked across it. And the idea is that it's common land. You can rent some of that land or you can put your cattle on the land. There are other areas in England that... There are still some common land, commons. But the point being, in the past, in the manorial system, everything was the commons. And so you would have the right to, to own a little slice of that land and farm it as a peasant. And you belonged to that land as well. So it was, I'm not saying it was a, necessarily saying it was a good or a bad system. I I'm, I'm kind of haven't really made my mind up about it, to be honest with you, because I'm kind of, I feel like I'm on the side of the peasants. I don't know. I'm, I've got to be honest, I'm confused. But uh, what happened is we had the Barons' Revolt, we had the Magna Carta, a few things happened. Then you had the birth of the English Parliament. What is the first act of English Parliament? The Act of Merton, off the top of my head. So the Act of Merton was a law which gave the um, Lords of England the right to enclose the land. This is the beginning of enclosure. So they started to enclose the common. So what was once the, the commonwealth, the common land of the people, the old Christian communism, the old feudal communism, it started to be closed off with hedges. And then they brought in the sheep. And then people started farming the sheep, started farming the wool. It's the birth of capitalism right there, Treaty of Merton birth of parliament birth of capitalism when we had the peasants revolt people were complaining about this when we had lots of revolts against the king none of them were successful but people were continually complaining about enclosure 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 they're taking our common land an old complaint in british society one that's been forgotten now in the english civil war you had the levellers. The levellers were called the levellers because they were levelling the land, which meant they were knocking down the hedges that divides up all the fields. They were fighting on the sides of the parliament, parliamentarians against the king and his autocracy. One of their complaints was enclosure. So you take what is common to everyone and then you shut it off and keep it for yourself that's capitalism so you know this is what i'm saying like i've got to i've got to bring all these ideas out into the open because i'm not even sure like right wing left wing am i capitalist am i communism you know it's like when you get into these ideas it's like mm, i don't know obviously i'm not a stalinist obviously i don't believe in in flipping communism as it's known and understood today but it does have its roots it is an ancient medieval thing and the peasants of England did 
fight for the common land and they fought for a long time and they were pissed off and you did have powerful lords who just screwed people over they're just like yeah i'll take this build a hedge around it and the whole of england is essentially the what it's a it's like a prison system isn't it the countryside it's just hedges it's just hedges all the peasants have moved into the towns and you've got these evil farmers now, and the evil farmers are, are supposedly the, the salt of the earth or the real Englishman. And they are, but they're also the, the great, 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 great grandchildren of some, you know, muscly guys that push some other guys off of the common land. See what I mean? They're capitalists. They're, they are the, the original capitalists of England. It's the old fight, long before the Industrial Revolution. Very interesting. I have not made my mind up about it because, I like for me personally, and I'm going on an absolute tangent here, but I mean this is bound to happen when we're dealing with this subject matter. For me personally, because I believe in racist anthropology, race realism, I look at the the English race and I think, well, the English race is an Anglo-Saxon race, it's a Germanic race, and in our natural habitat, we are inclined to behave in a certain way. Right? If you get rid of all the technology and, and the modern government, we will revert back to that way of living quite quickly. In a similar way, if you take all the modern technology and the modern government away from the Africans, they will quickly revert back to cannibalism because it's natural to them, that tribal life living in the jungle. In a similar way, you take all everything away from the modern day Germanic English white man, he will revert back to Germanic paganism. That is our natural way of living. And in that system of living, you had small clans and essentially tribal, small villages, small towns, we didn't have big cities. And we would fight with each other and, and, and there was a wilderness. It's not that one king would own an entire vast chunk of land. No, one king would have his fort or his village or whatever you call it in one part of the country and he would control that and perhaps some of the fields and so on and so forth outside it. Um, but then there was a wilderness of trees which wasn't really owned by anybody and you could walk through it. This is where the concept of the outlaw comes. The idea being that if you're in a certain town under the rule of a certain king, you live under his law. If he outlaws you, you are no, under, no longer under the protection of his law. You are out there in the world. It's, it's in Germanic mythology. Okay, all, the, all the, the gods, they live in Asgard and then they go out into the wilderness and they kill the trolls and things like that. The trolls aren't really evil. They're just symbolic of nature, like the giant beasts of nature. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's always been a wilderness. Is the communal system a wilderness? No, not really. Um, but, but, I don't know. Now we just have hedges. <laughs> Is that good? Is it bad? I don't know, guys. I don't know. But anyway, I'm still going to argue that individualism is masculine. Collectivism, the old communism, a little bit feminine. Uh, this idea that because women share things, women are very sharing. Women are in, uh, we're kind of inclined in, in that way. Women, women are, not, are not individualistic. Not really. They conform. I guess, I guess here I'm, I'm comparing individualism and the collectivism. They're two economic senses, but you've got individualism as a psychological state and, and conformitism, conformist. Yeah, women are conformist, 100%. They graduate towards the median. That's quite obvious. They just, they're not confrontational. They're not, um, yeah. They conform. We all know this. I remember Stefan Molyneux talking about this. Like he, he has a daughter, teenage, which she's probably grown up now, isn't she? But 
he remembers he I remember him talking about his teenage daughter and just saying that um the worst thing that could ever happen to her would be if she was expelled from her friendship group because that's what girls are like it's like they've got their they're very clicky like they've got their friendship group and they want to be in it and they meet each other and they're like oh hi oh your hair is beautiful they don't argue with each other they don't have banter like when men meet each other that you are bruv yeah yeah I was, I was talking to your wife last night or whatever <laughs> anyway you know they just fucking take the piss out of each other don't they do you know what I mean they've They've got the bants, confrontational, they play fighting with each other, right? So, women aren't like that. Women are just, oh, you're so beautiful, oh, oh, lovely, oh, darling, oh. Um, so, yeah, individualism, right wing, collectivism, left wing, individualism, right wing, conformitism, conformitism, conformism, whatever left wing private property right wing common ownership left wing again like it, it, it depends if you mean toxic private ownership or toxic individualism or, or hyper individualism as it's known today like when i'm talking about individualism i mean like either you by yourself on your quest for God, like you give up everything, you renounce and you're living, you're walking through the forest and you're searching for God, or it's you as a man going on an adventure around the world, or it's you as an individual man with your family. You know, that's the original individualism. You have a right to your own political opinions in your house. You have freedom of speech in your house. You have universal suffrage for men, essentially. Uh, but the original, but this modern day hyper individualism where everyone's just an alienated consumer unit is obviously, you know, separated from any kind of family life is obviously toxic. So again, this is where the isms, they kind of break down a little bit. Um, you know, toxic, I guess you could just put toxic by every single one of these categories, right? Toxic men, toxic women, toxic right wing, toxic left wing, toxic God, toxic God. Yeah, toxic God, the Abrahamic God, where it's like you will follow him or I will chop your head off. Right. There has to be a balance. The right wing and the left wing have to balance out with each other. That's why the middle path is the path to enlightenment. You see what I'm saying? Individualism is individualism by itself not great collectivism by itself not great a proper balance between individualism and collectivism yes man by himself lonely woman by herself lonely man and woman together create babies right that's the that's it guys that's the original thesis antithesis synthesis the the, the child is the synthesis Okay, Jesus is the synthesis. I'm getting spiritually enlightened, drinking my coffee and meditating on Jewish Kabbalah. Oh, I can feel it. I can feel it, guys. Oh, my God. But, I mean, there is a truth to it because the sexual instinct is selfish. It is the desire for pleasure. But what is the result of that selfish desire? Well, she gets pregnant, and then you got a baby, and you got to look after it. So now you have got to be responsible. You got to man up, and now all of a sudden you got to think about the economy. What child? What kind of world is my child going to grow into? Do you know what I mean? You got to give up your childish nature, your teenage nature. You got to become a man. Of course, the man, the manosphere would never tell you this because the manosphere wants to promote stunted masculinity, right? playboy masculinity teenage masculinity which is an aspect of masculinity yeah i mean young men it's natural for young men to be attracted to con artists like andrew tate with his muscles and his um tattoos and his um sports car and his money and blah 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 right because he's a peacock and it, he's selfish and he's interested in him in himself that is natural for young men to do that because 
because they're peacocking and because they want to attract a woman and women are attracted to peacocks and women are attracted to men who are trying to build build their lives and get selfish and make money and so it's natural but it's a stage and the idea being is you do that stage then you get someone pregnant and then you move on to the next stage where you're no longer peacocking and you are you know you assume responsibility Anyhow, um, next to my list, list hierarchy. The right wing believes in hierarchy. The left wing believes in equality. Again, balance between the two. Constitutional monarchy. The right wing believes in the king. The left wing believes in democracy. The right wing b believes. Well, look. I mean, here's here's where. I know I'm, I'm an hour and a half into this now. I knew, I knew this is going to be a big... I'm like, going to go off the wall with this. My voice is getting tired. I don't want to go on for too long. But let us let let me talk about this one last concept and then we'll sh shut the thing up. Um, idealism versus materialism. Because this is the reason why um, I'm making this in the first place. Because I tried to sit down last week and make a video called the metaphysics of the manosphere and it completely fell to pieces okay because i got halfway through it and i started talking about all of this and i realized i didn't really have my mind clear about it which is why i'm making this video today so let's talk about the difference between idealism and materialism okay this is a point i've been making recently in various different private conversations with people so i'm talking about metaphysics here okay what is metaphysics? It's a paradigm of thought within philosophy. It's a subject matter of, of discussion within philosophy. So essentially it is the study of what exists in the world. Okay, is there a God? Is there not a God? What is the universe made of? Is it made of water? Is it made of fire? Is it made of atoms? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Are there energy things like chakras? All of this. It's all metaphysics. Currently, we live under a, a metaphysical system which has been established by modern day science. So we live under the, the metaphysics of Newtonian physics, essentially, where scientists believe the, the universe is made of mathematics. Well, the scientists believe the universe is made of atoms, protons, neutrons, and these things are colliding into each other and they make chemicals and it's all governed by rules of mathematics. This is absolutely 100% taken for granted by everybody, 99% of the population, except for a few crazy re religious fanatics who may reject this. And this is why modern day philosophers, they don't talk about this at all. Modern day philosophy is primarily concerned with um, epistemology, right? the study of knowledge, where it comes from. And, and 20th century philosophy is concerned with language primarily. They've given up on the study of metaphysics. That has been all given to science. But anyway, I'm just trying to explain to you what metaphysics is, okay? So now you know what metaphysics is. There are two divisions within metaphysics. There's idealism and there's materialism. The modern metaphysical model given to us by science, the metaphysical model of Newtonian physics, is materialistic in that it only discusses matter physical matter there is no room in this model this metaphysical model there is no room for god the soul ghosts reiki chakras energies uh, or any other stuff all of that stuff is just hilariously laughed at by scientists because they can't prove it and and it's all just rejected as just being silly fluffy religious pseudo spiritual stuff uh, but nonetheless ancient philosophers would consider all these subject matters as part of their metaphysics um, so you have a division within metaphysics idealism versus materialism materialism the belief in a, a materialist metaphysics means matter everything is matter and that is the primary thing or it's, or it's just all exclusively matter. So you only believe in flesh and blood. You don't believe in anything above this. This is what atheists believe in, right? 
The idealist, on the other hand, he believes in ideals. And these ideals are transcendent to matter. They are above matter. They are spiritual. They are not made of flesh and blood. They are not made of atoms and electrons. They are something else. And the idea, the idealist believes that these ideals are primary and matter is matter is secondary. So the idea being that matter comes from the ideals. So the idea being, well, essentially, actually, not all idealists believe in God. But if you do believe in God, you must be an idealist because God is the original ideal. God is above matter. God is transcendent. God is spiritual. And he is the origin of everything. So he is the original idea, right? Everything comes from him. Uh, and in a similar way, that you're depending on your theological belief system or whatever the basic concept is that every tree in this world will be a representation of the ideal tree right or water is comes from an ideal water or fire comes from an ideal of fire or a chair comes from an ideal of a chair somewhere above us in heaven probably depending on your theological system but that's the basic concept. Uh, and I, I believe in this, of course. Um, and essentially, I mean, I don't know, like, like I was just thinking about this the other day, like, because I used to teach English. And one of my, oh, I'm going to have to do an entire video on English grammar one day. It's going to be very, very interesting and boring simultaneously. But nonetheless, one of the old English concepts was the idea of an abstract noun. And so an abstract noun, an abstract noun is a word like a noun like freedom. So you take the verb free, as in to free, and then you turn, you from that verb, you create a noun, but it's an abstract noun. So you have abstracted the essence of the movement, right? The essence of the verb, you've abstracted from that a concept an idea, an ideal, right? Freedom. And if you really want to take it to the fullest, this idea to, to its fullest extent, you can personify it. Now you have the personification of freedom, the goddess of freedom, right? So it's very interesting. I mean, I guess you could argue that nouns are male and verbs are female. And I think that's probably true, to be honest with you. I think that's probably true. Verbs are action and nouns are men, their names. I don't I mean I don't know anyway. Well God is a noun, isn't he? If you think about it. What comes first, the noun or the verb? Well God is a name. Everything comes from the name. I mean we're going on a tangent here. We're going on a tangent here. Um but if you want to just talk about it in terms of Sanskrit grammar, if you believe that Krishna is God then effectively, by the rules of Sanskrit grammar, you should be able to break down the name Krishna. Right? So you've got Kr and you've got Shna. <laughs> and look at the individual components. Because Sanskrit grammar is very, 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 very complicated. And you can take any single word and just divide it up. And like this means this and this means this. And this is rooted in this. And it just goes on for infinity. But by the rules of Sanskrit grammar, everything is within the name Krishna. Or Govinda is a better example. Govinda is another name for Krishna. Go means cow. So Govinda means the person who worships the cow. And then you get gopis from that. You get go. You get all kinds of different Sanskrit words, right? I won't go into it here, but essentially, essentially, in Vedic, in the Vedic philosophy, the idea is that everything is in the name of God. And Krishna is non different to his name. So this is true in a kind of woo woo kind of esoteric sense in that you say the name and everything and the name is God, so everything is in God. But it's also true in terms of the grammar itself. Sanskrit grammar itself. I do not know if I'm explaining this properly, but what I'm trying to say to you is that the correct Vedic conception is to say that essentially the entire universe is made of grammar. 
the entire universe is made of Sanskrit grammar. Okay? What I mean by that is that in the Vedic conception, the word go means cow, but the sound vibration go is non different from the physical object itself. Now, in English, cow is just a, a sound that you make, which is through force of habit, we've connected to a certain object, like the physical cow, right? In Sanskrit, the idea is that if you say, when, when God creates the universe, he says go, and from that sound, the cow appears. You see, it's not a Christian concept, interestingly enough. I've just been reading Genesis recently. I'm going to make a video on that. But Abraham names all the animals. Abraham names, not Abraham, Adam. Adam is the namer of animals, not God, which is really interesting. It's really interesting. If you think about it, if you compare it to the Vedic system, you know, the, the man, the man gets to name everything. God doesn't name the animals. Man name, no, man names the animals. This is the domain of man, right? Very different way of looking at things. Um, so that was a little bit of a tangent, but anyway, right wing, left wing, what I'm saying is everything's in the name and the name is a noun, right? From grammatical point of view. So the verb is secondary. The verb is the noun in action, right? Well, I mean, I don't know enough about grammar or Sanskrit grammar, but I'm, I'm feeling it. Anyway, what were we talking about here? What were we talking about? Yeah, I remember that. I was talking about abstract nouns, wasn't I? Yeah, so I was just making the point in old English grammar, you had a thing called the abstract noun. And so people would study grammar and they would understand this. Um, essentially, the abstract noun is an ideal. So you've taken, um, uh, but be, you look at modern day grammars, they've deleted this. They've totally screwed our language. Modern day grammar is very materialistic. In the modern, in modern day grammar, they, I mean, I don't know. It depends where you look. Like I've got so frustrated with trying to teach English grammar, but they've they've garbled and mished up, mishmashed the rules of our language essentially. But now you have abstract nouns versus concrete nouns. So now an abstract noun is just something non-physical, and a concrete noun is something physical. Well, this is just they've, they've, what? No, you've changed the rules of the language. You utter spastic. What have you done? What have you done? This is what I'm talking about earlier. 20th century philosophy. Obsessed with language. You've got a bunch of idiot French philosophers like Derrida. And these stupid people. They just made up a bunch of garbage. And they've butchered the English language from the inside. You've got no idea. I, I went to school. We didn't even study grammar. But grammar is fundamental for an understanding of anything. First you learn grammar, then you learn logic, then you learn, you know, if you don't know your grammar, you can't think properly because you don't know what words mean. Anyway, it's a whole different subject matter. Um, but essentially they've purged the English language of its idealism. So, anyway... Point being, the point I'm trying to make is, is my opinion that idealism is male and materialism is female. Why is idealism male? Because it's on the side of God, it's transcendent, it's in the mind, it's high IQ. Materialism is female because it's it's pagan. <laughs> it's it's in the flesh and blood. Women are in the flesh of flesh and blood. It's in this world. And there's an, there's another duality between rationalism and empiricism, right? The, now we're talking about epistemology, the study of knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? So there are two ways, primary sources of knowledge: rationalism, you the mind; empiricism, you look at the universe and you measure things. So women believe it if they can see it. They're not good at thinking about higher abstract concepts. This is a male thing. It's also a high IQ thing. Men have high IQs. Women have lower IQs. Um, high IQ thinking is also something you do in, in a solitary environment. 
people with a, with a high intelligence are more inclined to be alone or they have the ability to be alone women can't be alone they get really lonely because they're lower IQ so they've got to be with other people because it's safer for them I guess but the high IQ man he actually craves solitude so that he can think by himself so he can get away everybody else's mucky concepts and he can sit by himself and he can get a clear idea of what's going on and develop something new develop some new creative genius which comes from individualism, which comes from solitude. So you, do you see what I'm saying here, guys? I've, I've had about enough of rambling on about this, but uh, but that that is my basic attempt to make a division between the right wing and the left wing, the male and the female, God and chaos. What else have we got? Day and night. Oh, just staring at the sun. Heaven and hell. Order and chaos. Individualism and collectivism. Private property and common ownership, hierarchy and equality, the king and democracy, rationalism and empiricism, privacy and non-privacy, free speech and censorship, freedom and slavery, high IQ and low IQ, mind and body, rationalism and empiricism, idolism and materialism, truth and lies. There you go. That's my list. And we talked about some other things as well, didn't we? But There you go. I've opened up that subject matter. Please say something in the comment section. Tell me, tell me what you think. Am I crazy? Am I wrong? I think everybody should do this. Everybody should sit down, write out these concepts, think it through in your mind, get it clear. Obviously, like I say, there has to be a balance between the two. You, like, the idealism and the materialism, like... German idealism, totally terrible. Total just wish-wash, mishmash, lost in your mind craziness. Uh, the continent is famous for idealism and the continent is famous for rationalism. England is famous for empiricism, i.e. science, and materialism, which goes hand in hand with imperialism. Does this mean that we are not idealists? No, you can still believe in God and be an empiricist. It's just that you place, place more emphasis on proving things and this has allowed us to conquer the world and create technology and so on and so forth um, so there, there is such a thing as toxic idealism which in my opinion is German idealism which is just word salad like it's Spengler it's Evola it's Hegel it's um, Morgoth <laughs> it's Keith Woods it's Richard Spencer, it's Jonathan Bowden, it's blah, 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 blah. I like Jonathan Bowden, okay, but but still, like some of the stuff he said, you, you listen and you're like, you've just strung together a whole bunch of big words. I mean, it sounds pretty cool, but you know, like what are you talking about? Like, what does that mean in the real world? It's poetry, okay? Um, if you follow the path of idealism too much, like you have toxic idealism, you, you're going to end up with you know, Plato. Plato thought that women fighting in the army was a good idea. He was the original feminist. So, you know, is it, what's left wing, what's right wing? Do you see what I mean? It's a concept. You're going to, you drag back this way, back this. And this is why the whole left wing, right wing thing all ends up just being fluffy, you know. There's always got to be like a middle path, the balance between the two. Essentially, these two poles of thought. So, yeah, there you go. That's it. I've had enough rambling about this. Anyway, God bless. I hope you enjoyed that. It's probably confused you. It's confused me. And that's it. Don't forget to share the video with your friends. God bless. Hail Woden. <laughs>